for the annual meeting. For the meeting and everything. I mean, I just huh? missed all the birding Saturdays. Good afternoon, not. everybody. We didn't go Saturday. Sorry to interrupt. Don't, don't bring up a good conversation. I know. It, it's always <laughs> hard, but, but we're live on the internet now, and I don't want those people waiting. Oh. So here we are. Welcome to the Dorset Historical Society's <coughs> third Thursday lunchtime lecture for March of 2022, um, well into our 11th year of these third Thursday lunchtime lectures, which is amazing and great. What always amazes me is how we never run out of great speakers to have. Yes. And today we have from Champlain College, Professor Michael Lang, who is an anthropologist and folklorist, and he's going to talk about his work on um, ethnography of Maple sugar. Welcome. Thank you, everybody. Um, and I genuinely mean thank you. I don't just mean thank you for a uh, round of applause. I mean thank you for caring enough about learning to come out with something like this. Um, I spend most of my professional life now in the classroom talking to uh, students, and I absolutely love it. But they're there because they have to be there. Y'all are here because you want to be here. <laughs> and um, I, as much as I enjoy my students, and I very much do, I very much do, um, <clears throat> um, getting to be in a situation like this where it's just people who have come out because they're interested and they think this might be something worth listening to, it's, it, it makes me happy. So I, I really appreciate that. Um, I'm here to talk about <clears throat> the meanings of maple. That's the you know, sort of headline title of the talk. Um, and as I was uh, pulling out, I noticed the little sandwich board sign on uh, by the road said, uh, Maple Culture, uh, Noon, or something along those lines. Um, how do those things go together? Uh, because people think about maple, they think about it as an activity. They think about it as uh, maybe the scientific study of it has to do with the uh, agronomy or the chemistry or things like that. But how is maple a cultural thing? And this is actually not a rhetorical question. I'm asking you all. How is maple a cultural thing? What does maple mean to you? Vermont. Vermont. <laughs> Expand on that a little bit, because that's, that's a, a big, and I mean, we're not kidding here. There's a map of Vermont on the front of my book for a reason. Um, <clears throat> so what do you mean when you say Vermont? Well, the maple tree is ubiquitous in Vermont, but New England, really, I, I think more of the tree mm. than I do of the, the syrup or the, the byproduct, but you know, the, the majesty of the tree itself mm -hmm. and um, it, what it yields to us. Beautiful lumber and beautiful, um, you know, byproducts of sap. And yeah, I mean, on one hand, the maple is, it's a biological organism. It's a tree. It's a plant, mm -hmm. right? And you use the word majesty, which I think is uh, grandiose and apt because I mean, people come to Vermont to look at the colors for a reason, right? Maple trees, regardless of the season, they have a grandness about them, but especially in the fall, you can't ignore it. They sort of scream at you uh, mm -hmm. with their colors, and it's, it's beautiful, it's amazing. So that is a meaning that maples have. They, they bring people to this place to partake in that majesty, uh, because you can't very easily pick up a maple and move it around the country. You gotta kinda come here to do it, absolutely. So what else about Vermont? <clears throat> you, you were starting to expound a little bit. No, I just was gonna say, <laughs> maple is Vermont and Vermont is maple. It's just, um, it's the, I started coming here with my family when I was in about fourth grade. Mm -hmm. And all I knew was maple syrup. Mm -hmm. I mean, that just, that just stuck with me. I've always known that Vermont meant maple syrup. Now you say you started coming here when you were a, a small kid. Mm -hmm. So presumably you grew up, you were born somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Ohio. Okay, oh, interesting. I mm -hmm. as well. <laughs> ah! Here. Here, Ohio maple syrup. Uh, I grew up in a, a little town called St. Mary's. It's just oh west in the middle of nowhere. My cousins are in St. Mary's. <laughs> my father's from St. Mary's. I was in Toledo. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Who's your father? Huh? Who's your father? Jim Brady was his name. Jim Brady. Uh, I, I don't know if Brady rings a bell. Sorry, we're just having a moment. Y'all can... <laughs> <laughs> my, my second cousins are the Lawlers. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, right. Ned Lawler. Lawler and, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. We'll talk later. Yes, absolutely. That's, that's not a connection I was expecting to make. Actually, a little bit of trivia for you, um, and this is for everybody. Um, I do have a bottle here that is labeled Ohio syrup. Um, now, in I understand I'm taking my life into my hands doing that in the state of Vermont. Um, but for the first two decades of the 20th century, the state 
that produced the most maple syrup was Ohio. Oh, I never thought of that. Yeah, you wouldn't. People wouldn't. I didn't was know that, that because so many Vermonters went out there? <laughs> 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 they just brought the, the maple yeah. with them. Um, well, in some measure, yes, uh, because there was a there secondary was. immigration um, and uh, even a couple of companies uh, that are sort of well known in the maple world now uh, started or expanded greatly in Ohio. Uh, either people uh, transplanted from uh, Maine, uh, Massachusetts, or Vermont. And so there's more connection, sort of maple connection between Vermont and Ohio than might be evident on the surface. Mm. Um, there's still a significant uh, amount of maple made in Ohio. Compared to Vermont, no. Um, but uh, even compared to Franklin County, no. But <clears throat> there is still a maple industry in Ohio and there are enough maple trees. The only problem is they're more dispersed. In Vermont, they're very densely packed and that creates efficiencies uh, if you're trying to create or trying to make maple syrup in, in sort of economically sustainable way. Um, but yeah, Ohio has, they've got a little bit of a toe in the maple story. Um, mm -hmm. And they used to be the big player. Um, uh, yeah, a couple of the uh, evaporator companies were established in Ohio and have since sort of come back this way. Um, <clears throat> Should I go? Yes, we will definitely talk a little bit later. Um, what else does uh, maple mean to you? I don't know, spring and mud mud. Yeah, <laughs> spring and mud mud. Um, <clears throat> that's that, that's a, a really interesting one because maple is tied to a point in the calendar. Yeah. Now the point moves, obviously. It's not a you know, start date on you know, January 6th kind of thing. But there is definitely a, a calendrical element to maple. And I've had more than a few sugar makers talk to me about uh, maple being the start of spring. Spring? Vermont? February? Um, well, weather-wise, no, not so much. Uh, Climate-wise, maybe not so much, but conceptually, yeah, maple is a springy thing. It's uh, the, the the first run of the season is kind of what marks it, as opposed to like the first robin of the season where I grew up in Ohio. Um, there are other things that people use to mark. This is the thing that I experience that means spring has sprung, even if weather-wise, amount of snowfall-wise, spring hasn't sprung. Up here, click. Okay, I get to flip the switch over. I get to flip that mental calendar over. Why do you reckon that might be? What is it about? I think the days are longer, and they're noticeably longer by now. You know, they start in December, but uh, mm -hmm. when you get to February and March, it's really noticeable. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you have daylight savings time. But sure. Well, maybe you know, it's kind of hard to <laughs> <laughs> um, But yes, the you feel it in the lengthening of the day. Uh, yeah. When you cross over that uh, point in December where the calendar starts, where the days start to get longer, longer, you feel it a bit in January because, as you point out, you really start to feel it now. Um, you look out the window when it's you know time to feed the cats and go, wow, it's still light out. And at least that's how we yeah. work it in my house. Uh, we have four of them, so you know they're the ones who tell us when it's evening. Um, <clears throat> but uh, you feel that much more intensely at this point of year, absolutely. What else is calendrical about it, though? Well, it's an awakening, too. You've got the, the sounds um, are increasing of the birds, spring, whatever else, mm -hmm. and the smells, um, and just the whole atmosphere and sense that something's changing mm -hmm. is old, is coming, it's there. And the sounds of the rivers and the streams right, flowing right. Mm -hmm. with the snow melt. Mm -hmm. The flowers, snowdrops are up. The sap. Yeah, yeah. And anticipation, because, you know, if you've been tapping, Think, oh gosh, I gotta get to work now. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a simultaneous, oh my gosh, here it comes, and oh my gosh, here it comes. <laughs> 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 Anybody Absolutely. who's ever tapped a tree knows that feeling. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, there, also, it's the first agricultural harvest of the year. Uh, you're talking about that. Uh, How does that come into play? Because that's a biggie, and it's tied in with everything else we're talking about, too. Hmm. What do you mean by that? What's When you say it's the first agricultural harvest of the year, what do you mean? Well, uh, the harvest before maple is traditionally logging. Mm. when they could cut down trees and move them easily on the frozen ground. Mm. But this is the first thing you get from a plant that's growing. Yeah, yeah. And if you think about uh, who traditionally is the sugar maker in Vermont, it's a farmer. Um, mm. Sugaring in Vermont is an agricultural thing. Now that's not true of all sugaring. If you go to Maine, the identity of sugar maker in Maine is much more closely tied into the identity of the the woodsman, the logger. And if you think about it, well, it kind of makes sense. Who is in among the woods? 
but yeah. mainly slaughters in Vermont, it's farmers, because we have hill farms here. Um, and farmers want nothing more than to produce. I mean, it's called the produce section in the grocery store for a reason. They make something. They make something from living processes, uh, plants or animal. Um, <clears throat> Maple is the first thing of the calendar year that you harvest. Now, har you use the word harvest as well. Harvest is an interesting word in this context. Um, if I'm harvesting corn or harvesting it, look at that picture against the back wall. There are people who are harvesting what looks like some sort of cereal grain. Um, you do that by cutting down a plant and taking it in and taking some part of it from the plant. You don't cut down maple trees. You don't cut them down and like, squeeze all of the syrup out. Um, despite what my three-year-old nephew might have us believe at times. Um, what does it mean to harvest when you're talking about maple? Yeah. Maple. Kill a hole, yeah. put in the tubes, don't give back what you gave. They, they, yeah. But so, you have to do an awful lot of preparation with the tube first. Making sure the deer haven't gone through your tubes. Or every 20, and once in a couple of years, Yeah, there's an enormous amount of uh, labor involved throughout the year. One of the things that tubing uh, did uh, was it didn't make sugaring easier. It took the work and kind of distributed it a little bit differently um, so that it's not all, oh, for two months I have to do nothing but. It's now, okay, I can do some of that work in November. Uh, I can do some of the checking of the lines in November, but as you said, you have to go back out periodically and you have to make sure that the deer haven't come through and knocked them down and the squirrels haven't chewed them or whatever. Um, but it's spread the work out at both at the very least. Um, but the labor being distributed uh, it's, uh, kind of, I'm trying to think how I want to say this, I don't want to say it hides the fact that it's uh, the, the way in which it, it's an agricultural process, but it doesn't make it very clear the way in which, an ag in which it is an agricultural process. Because when you're out in the fields, I planted those grains, I'm cutting those grains now that, that uh, they have grown, I'm going to bring them in, I'm going to thresh, I'm going to smoke. That's a pretty straightforward put in place, take from place process. But with maple, it's not that way. The maples are out there. And you go out there and you drill a hole and you put in a tap and maybe you hang a bucket or you hang some uh, tubing. But you're kind of borrowing from the tree. You're borrowing from a naturally occurring thing. Now, that said, stands of maple are not wild natural. They're tended. People interact with them. Um, maple stands are as much a human thing as they are a natural thing. But they're a little bit further down the borderline between human and natural than that field of cereal grains. So there's a little bit of a an agricultural <coughs> slash wild desert kind of aspect to it. Yet it fits into the agricultural calendar. It is that first thing that a farmer produces from the land in the calendar year, typically, especially from a living source. <clears throat> so it has a strong meaning that then gets associated with other climatic things like spring. It becomes the first thing of spring. And that makes sense if you think about what farmers want to do. They want to produce. It's the first produce of the land. What else? <clears throat> you know, it reminds me of climate change problems, how right it is to tap the trees, as long as you don't over tap them. But mm -hmm. But you're taking from something that exists, and you're aware of not taking too much because it might ruin it. And it's the way we should be dealing with a lot of what we take from the earth. Yeah, there's an awful lot of, <clears throat> it, it sort of cracks me up when uh, people talk about sustainability as if it's something that was invented like five years ago. <laughs> the concept of sustainable has been around for millennia all over the world in all sorts of cultures. Um, it's just now some people are kind of remembering it, uh, interestingly. Mm -hmm. Now, you talk about tapping in terms of uh, uh, take, uh, sort of limiting what you take. Um, how does that work with maple? How is maple kind of built to limit, to not overdo, not, to not overtake? Well, it's limited time-wise. Yeah. Keep talking. It's, it's a natural occurrence that starts and then stops to make it where it's not worth taking anymore. Yeah, so the climate, the trees themselves, this is part of their majesty yeah. in the way I think about it actually, is they're, they know what's going on as much as we do. 
Um, but they only produce sap that's worth taking for a limited time of year. So they kind of tell us, yeah, you're done now. I'm budding. Go away. Come back in, in you know, 10 months. So that's a limiting factor. How else? The number of taps in the tree, that's what I was thinking. Keep I mean, you don't want to do too many, I would think that would mm -hmm. weaken the tree. Yeah, the, there is an awful lot of conventional wisdom, and conventional wisdom being conventional and wisdom, it's quite a range of you know, things that fall into the category. Some people will say you know, only this many taps per circumference, you know, inches, some of this many taps per acre. There are different ways people navigate it. But in the middle of all those navigations are, there is some upper limit pass which we don't want to take sap from a tree within a given year. Um, and the tree itself also helps in that regard um, by a couple of biological processes that uh, make tapping a sustainable process uh, that have comparatively little to do with us as the species. They have to do with what the tree is able to do. We have figured it out, um, but it's the tree doing it. Um, <clears throat> this is not to be sort of too blatant to show off my book here, um, but uh, this thing, the image on the front, you can pass it around, is uh, a, it, it's an outline map of Vermont. Um, <clears throat> and it's made of what's called tap hole maple. Um, several of you are familiar, I've been seeing nodded heads. Um, for those of you who don't know, tap hole maple is just uh, maple wood from a tree that has been cut down that in the past has been tapped. So if you look on the front cover, you'll see there are several little circular mm -hmm. chunks taken out of the wood, those are old tap holes. Now if you look above and below the tap holes on that, you'll see this very dark streak of wood. Anybody know what that is? It's healing. It's healing? Uh, of a sort. Keep talking. <laughs> That's all I got. <laughs> it's, it's the way the tree um, reacts to the fact that it's been tapped. Yeah. Whatever it does. Yeah. It's turning off the, the circuit, the faucet, so to speak. Yeah, that's, that's a really apt metaphor for it. It's a process called encapsulation. Um, I did that. And, <laughs> <laughs> I was just filling the book. Um, but no, you're, you're describing it uh, very aptly. It's the tree saying, you put a hole inside of me, you have created a wound, because let's not mince words, drilling a hole inside a tree is wounding the tree. But the tree is smart enough and good enough to react to that in a way that it's okay. It's, it creates this capsule around that wound and that then affects the tissue above and below because the sap flows vertically up and down uh, the trunk of the tree. That's why you get the, the uh, coloration uh, vertically up and down the trunk of the tree. It creates a capsule around that wound and says, okay, I'm gonna segment you off from the rest of the tree so that any bacterial invasion that comes through that hole doesn't spread throughout the tree, it kind of gets stuck in there. I'm gonna turn off the faucet, uh, if you will, so that that wood kind of uh, ossifies a little bit. Ossifies not really the right word, it doesn't turn to bone. Um, but it, it sort of dies a little bit, but it dies in a protective way. Uh, it's sort of like scar tissue, um, at least metaphorically. Um, you all can't see it from where you're sitting, but uh, I have a chunk of pencil lead in my arm right there. I've had it since third grade. You too? Right here. Was it the same kid who did yours? <laughs> <laughs> same time. I was going to say. <laughs> Um, I, I got mine in third grade. We were uh, standing in the hallway coming back from lunch or coming back from recess or something. We were all stood in the hallway waiting to go in our classroom. And one of my friends um, had a pencil and just turned it, boom, and just jammed it in my arm. And oh, it And the, yeah, no, no. It's the same friend. <laughs> um, but the pencil had broke off, and it's still in there. Um, you can actually see it come up close, I urge you not to. Um, but it's still in there. Uh, it's in there because my body has uh, created a little capsule around it. Basically sort of sealed it off from the rest of my body and says, okay, you're not going to do any harm. You're going to sit there for the rest of my life, apparently. Yeah. Um, but you're going to stay in your little pocket. Encapsulation is, in some ways, a similar sort of process. You drill the hole and say, okay, I'm going to create a little capsule around you so that you don't get to affect anything else. You're just sort of stuck there. That little bit of tissue doesn't then affect the rest of the tree. The trees had this mechanism in them and had long before human beings ever showed up. Um, <clears throat> but it's handy for us because that limits what we can do to the tree. Now, we could drill a thousand holes in a tree and try to get all the sap out at once, and it would kill the tree, yes. Um, but, uh, I'll get that back in a second. Um, <coughs> but because it has this mechanism, we can drill a hole, and then next year, after that was encapsulated and healed, you can drill a different hole, and the year after that, you can drill a different hole. And the tree can survive for decades, centuries even, through that process. 
But what that does tell you is not to drill the hole in the same line yep. as the one you drilled last year. Yeah, exactly. That's why I was sort of moving around the tree. Yeah. There, there are, and that's another uh, sort of place where there's a lot of conventional wisdom about where do you put a tap hole. You never want to put one directly above or below a previous year's tap hole um, for exactly that reason. There's dead tissue there. Uh, it's also a little bit more destructive to the tree because you're kind of wounding into the wound, if you will. Um, <clears throat> Interestingly, uh, even though several people have mentioned several different senses, a lot of you talked about sight, sound, smell, nobody's talked about taste yet. <laughs> what does maple mean to punk? What does maple mean to you conceptually there? So smooth. So sweet. Smooth. And did you say smooth? Yeah. Um, we'll get to smooth in just a second because that's an interesting response. <laughs> but talk to me about sweet first because I heard that one first. It is sweet. Oh, I can't believe it. Morning. This is fruit. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that is very much the lily, I think. That's free source. Um, <laughs> that's right. So you got to use it somewhere. That's <laughs> wonderful. I mean, I mean, the flavor is definitely is a maple flavor, and you can make a lot of icings and other things with it. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And you've hit on two different aspects of maple, both in the culinary. One of them is simply it is sweet. It is a source of sugar. Sugar is not very easily accessible. Historically and prehistorically. Um, I mean, nowadays, yeah, it is. You go to any grocery store and they've got 58 different kinds of sugar, and it's frankly far too cheap for you know, mm -hmm. physiques like mine. Um, but historically speaking, sugar in sort of a chemical form is not an easy get from the environment in the climate we're sitting in at the moment. Now, the closer you get to the equator, the easier it gets. Um, the uh, predominance of uh, fruit uh, and the variety of fruit. Here, not a whole lot of fruit to be had. Um, there aren't that many fruits that are that readily accessible uh, without a lot of human intervention. But maple sap, and especially the blood bounce here, it gives you a ready-made source of sugar, absolutely. But you also described the particularities of maple flavor. Um, <clears throat> has anybody ever tried to describe the flavor of maple to somebody who's never had it? No, I don't think I could. Why not? Because you're right. It's I don't think like it. <laughs> you can't compare it to it has a set of flavors, and the people who have done the chemical research talk about hundreds and hundreds of flavor compounds that are in it. Um, it has a set of flavors that don't really appear anywhere else. Um, they're what uh, people who study you know, sort of food from a cultural uh, standpoint and a sensory standpoint call it ineffable. It's an ineffable flavor. Mm -hmm. It's like mm -hmm. coffee or vanilla or one of those things that you think of as the thing you use to describe other stuff with. Okay. It is so singular, so particular, that it is the point of comparison. You can't compare it to other stuff. You say, well, it's kind of like maple, because everybody has a sense of if they've had maple, where that is on their kind of conceptual map. So that's an intensely strong meaning. It's a meaning on the tongue, but it's also a meaning up here when we're trying to understand flavors, um, maps of flavors. Well, the imitations have never well, that's what my question is. What, what do the imitations use? Yeah. <clears throat> um, there are uh, a few different things. Um, a lot of, uh, one of the most uh, well-known artificial maple flavorings is a chemical, uh, chemical called sotolon. Um, there are different sources of sotolon, but one of the uh, historical sources was the outer husk of fenugreek seeds. And you know fenugreek? It's a, it's a spice. Um, <clears throat> The, uh, you're looking at me like I just kicked a puppy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, fenugreek seeds uh, have this uh, chemical sotolon in them, and you can extract it, and that is used as a uh, maple mm. flavoring, artificial maple flavoring. Mm. Uh, interestingly, fenugreek, if anybody is into any sort of holistic health or medicine, fenugreek is something that uh, a lot of people will encourage to give to nursing mothers to support, uh, uh, the, support nursing. Um, and it's not uncommon for nursing mothers who take fenugreek seeds or fenugreek extract to support the nursing to report that their sweat smells like maple syrup. <laughs> and I mean, the connection is, I, I haven't studied these sort of biochemical processes, but I gotta, I gotta think that's cause and effect right there. Um, that the sodalon is somehow being processed uh, in their bodies. And it creates this artificial maple aroma. Um, there are other sources of artificial maple, uh, but that's, 
that's one that I think is interesting. Um, yeah, on, on NPR or UPR, yesterday there was a profile of a company in Vermont that is making smells. Mm -hmm. and I can't think of the name oh. right off the top of my head, but um, that's it, they're up in the Burlington area. Oh, okay. All right. so, uh, if you can, I'll give you my card again. Uh, <laughs> if you can uh, think of the name prior to me. Yeah, and, um, and they were talking about um, some of the smells that they've already successfully. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, you know, uh, of course, I don't know. I don't, I don't think of maple syrup as being a strong smelling um, as much as tasting. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's definitely aromatic, but it's not a thing you associate primarily with smell. It's more the yeah. smell part of tasting yeah. that, because yeah. we all know that if you lose your sense of smell your sense of taste craters as well because a lot of what we taste is actually happening back here mm -hmm. uh, in the nose and the nasal cavities um, and maple has that going on but yeah just as a smell into itself mm, I don't I don't think of it terribly much as such yeah. OVR technology OV, oh you just google that up yes ah, Thank wonders you. of the internet OVR technology yeah. Yeah. actually I looked up the VPR article oh okay fair enough um, yeah, I will look them up. I, uh, this is this is new info for me. Um, but while we're talking about uh, tastes, um, I'm going to pass around this. This is from uh, the University of Vermont and the Vermont Agency of Ag. Um, there, there, there are a couple of placards. I'll, I'll pass this one around first. This is a map of tasting notes <coughs> for maple syrup. Um, just take a quick glance at that, and as you're doing so, um, give me a sense of, of your reaction to it. How does it, uh, what do you think about it? And that one, as that one's going around, I'll start this one in the back. Um, this is a uh, map of off flavors. Um, it's again from the same folks, the uh, University of Vermont Agency of Ag. Um, these are flavors that are considered to be uh, problems in finished maple syrup. Um, <clears throat> so I'll pass this around. Well, the, um, syrup, you know, the color changes. I mean, maybe you get later in the season, there are more. Uh, sharper taste to this to the syrup usually although the color and the flavor don't directly correlate no. um, it is quite often the case that the mm. flavors develop over the course of the season and the color develops over the course of the season but those are not cause and effect with one another I don't know about um, you can have very intensely flavored very light syrup and conversely very mm. mild flavored very dark syrup um, some of the taste inclusions, uh, especially as you get later into the season, uh, have to do with things like bacterial inclusions uh, in the, the wines and pans and stuff like that, um, as well as the, just the tree itself is, you know, it's changing its chemistry as it goes through the season. Is there only one kind of maple tree that is tap for syrup? Uh, no, there's uh, quite a few. Uh, in Vermont, one of the things that uh, makes Vermont a center of the maple world is a, uh, a strong density of what are called sugar maple. Uh, Acer saccharum is the, the uh, binomial nomenclature. Um, Acer saccharum is uh, sort of the gold standard, if you will, of uh, <coughs> this part of the world. Um, <clears throat> primarily because the sap that uh, Acer saccharum produces tends to have a higher concentration of sugar in it. Um, <clears throat> you'll get numbers all over the place, but if you're getting 2% sugar uh, in the sap that comes out of the tree, you're starting off pretty well. Some people will get higher, two and a half, three percent. Some people will be one and a half, five percent. My brother uh, taps uh, trees in Ohio. Actually, he still lives back in Ohio, um, and uh, he uh, said this season he was getting uh, about one and a half percent out of his trees. Uh, he taps like I think fifteen trees, so it's you know, very much a, a backyard operation kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> so the 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 amount of sugar in the sap can vary quite a bit. The sugar maples tend to have uh, a higher concentration and so give you a bit of a head start. Um, <clears throat> that also allows you to boil for less time to get to syrup consistency because the longer you boil the more chance you have of introducing sort of acrid flavors. Um, has anybody ever tasted uh, uh, any uh, like birch syrup or walnut syrup or butternut syrup? Mm. There are a few other uh, trees that have enough sugar in them that you can you know, boil and make. Those other syrups tend to have kind of bitter notes in them um, <clears throat> because they need more water. Um, and there's also some of the you know, chemistry of the trees involved there, obviously. Um, <clears throat> but there are several species of tappable maple. Uh, <clears throat> a, you'll, people will tap red maples, summer maples. Uh, there are also various uh, uh, 
vernacular names, local names. Uh, people will talk about rock maple and swamp maple uh, and its vernacular names for uh, species of maple. Anything that's got enough sugar in the sap, you can boil. Um, many acer species uh, have that. Um, uh, many of the yugon species, the walnuts, uh, butternuts have that. Um, birch trees, as I mentioned before, they have that. Um, the key is, and this is reference to uh, something you mentioned before, having a time in the year where you can reliably get sap that is worth boiling. Because there are maple species all over the world. <clears throat> there are maple species, uh, they live in a circle of the world, and pretty wide range of <laughs> Um, not all of them are tappable though, not because of the chemistry of the tree, not because of the amount of uh, sugar and sap, but because of the unpredictability of when you're going to get good, boilable rotten. Uh, here, where we are, and we are kind of in the geographic center of this region, extends throughout eastern Canada, west now eastern Canada, west now eastern U.S., um, <clears throat> we're kind of in the middle of it right here. This is the place where you get the confluence of the temperature swings at the right time of year, the predictability, the right species of tree, the right underlayment underneath the trees to support the chemistry of the tree, make all of those sorts of things kind of come together here. Um, <clears throat> so that makes the maples around here much more readily tappable, uh, if you will. Um, but there are a lot of species that you can tap box elders. Um, there are people who will tap broadleaf maples, uh, or what's sometimes called big leaf maples, uh, out in Nebraska. Um, <clears throat> so you, know, you can. You can drill a hole in anything and you know, boil it and see what happens. Um, I don't necessarily support that as a, a way of doing your gardening, but um, yeah, there are a lot of species that are, are tappable. Um, interestingly, there are uh, people who have tried to uh, export, for lack of a better term, uh, maple tapping. The maple syrup exports you know, quite nicely all around the world. But um, <clears throat> there, there's one guy who's a, who's a researcher at um, uh, Cornell University who uh, has a book, he uh, tells a story about uh, somebody he knows, who tried to plant a bunch of maple trees in Denmark. And uh, the idea was he wanted to tap them there and start creating local Danish maple syrup. But it didn't work because the climate wasn't quite right. They didn't get the proper temperature swings mm -hmm. uh, because you need, it's not just certain temperatures you need uh, for a maple to run, you need certain temperature swings over a 24 hour period. Mm -hmm. And uh, they just didn't get that in Denmark. So a lot of beautiful maple trees that have been landscaped into somewhere in Denmark, but they don't run reliably enough. So, but they grew there well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they grew quite happily. Does, does the soil make a difference? Because we've got the tectonics and then the Green Mountain soil. Absolutely. <clears throat> if you look at a, a map of maple, um, uh, if you, I'm in a. a sort of privileged position of having been able to taste maple syrups from an enormous range of places. Uh, a lot of sugar makers taste a lot of maple, but it tends to be you know, from them and their friends. Um, I've tasted maple that's from Minnesota, I've tasted maple that's from Newfoundland, um, and pretty much everywhere in between. That's part of it, probably explain what's going on here. Um, <clears throat> if you draw a line down the middle of the Green Mountains, the rock that underlies the soil on the west and the rock that underlies the soil on the east is very different from one another. You get your marbles and your granites, you get your sort of slates and your shales. Um, that shapes the tastes that you get out of the maple. Um, <clears throat> if your maple trees are on soil that has more sort of limestone, granite, marble type soils underneath it, you tend to have a little bit more of a kind of apple, orange, sort of citrusy sweetness in them. <clears throat> if you get a little bit to the west uh, in Vermont and you're a little bit more sort of slates and shales, it tends to get a little more toward kind of powdered sugar marshmallow kind of sweetness. Um, mm -hmm. That's not hard and fast rule because uh, Vermont has nothing if not an abundance of microclimates and micro uh, geologic zones. Um, so you will find all sorts of variation. And whether you're on a north facing slope or south facing slope, and therefore how much early sun it gets in the day, all these things will come into account. But there is a pretty strong tendency of the, you know, the sort of marble shale kind of line uh, through Vermont. So yeah, the soil and the rocks underneath the soil uh, matter very much to the, the final maple, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> interestingly, uh, there's a, a species of maple, so we've talked about you know, tapping in, in various places. There's a species of maple called Acer mono, uh, which is common in, uh, I don't know how big its range is, but it's uh, uh, tapped in sort of northeast China and the Korean Peninsula. They actually tap the trees and they harvest the sap. They don't boil it though. 
they drink it like coconut water. It's sort of you know health tonic slash you know trendy drink in the way coconut water is in a lot of places here. Um, so you do see tapping in this place, but you don't see the boiling. They're not turning into the syrup. It's more you know, like a natural health drink kind of thing. Um, yeah. Well, there is that place in Pulte that's just uh, bottles of sap and carbonated cinnamon, mm -hmm. it's maple soda. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there are uh, several places. Uh, this is a company called uh, Siva uh, Maple Water. This one, I believe, is from Montreal. Oh. Uh, pretty, uh, pretty to say there. Yeah. <laughs> and this is Canada. There's probably uh, a, uh, an address on there somewhere. Um, but yeah, uh, the kind of post coconut water sort of phase of you know what's going to be the next big easy to access health drink that we can extract from nature and sort of play up it in the marketing that is straight from nature. Maple sap fits that bill quite nicely. And so there are uh, several companies. Um, as you point out, there's uh, one company that's carbonating it and sort of turning it into a, a, what we think is a soft drink or a soda or a pop, depending on where you are from in the country. Um, but there are plenty of places that are just uh, bottling up, or in this case, you know, petropacking up uh, the sap by itself. Um, uh, yeah, it certainly is. There's less hoo-ha involved. Um, <laughs> the uh, the one problem is the perishability of it. Yeah. Anybody who's ever tapped maple trees knows that you got to get the sap pretty quick. It'll, it'll turn on you if you, you let it. Um, but uh, getting it in a, uh, a sanitary state into a container that's going to you know sort of remain sealed. Um, if you got that part down, then yeah, it's a very sellable product. Um, a lot of the growth in the maple world. Uh, the economic growth in the maple world um, is not so much in the syrup, it's in other products, sort of maple syrup adjacent products, secondary products like you know, flavorings or maple crunchies or um, inclusions in baked goods, or before you get to the uh, syrup stage, things like the sap. Um, <clears throat> the, well, let me ask you all this. Where do you think, let's just talk about the syrup right now, where do you think the biggest growth markets are? in maple syrup, geographically. Additives and food and sweeteners. Um, I'm talking geographically here. Whereabouts oh, in the world? Oh, where in the world? Canada. China's bought up a lot oh, okay. in maple trees. Yeah. New England. You're a lot closer. China, Japan, Australia are the biggest <laughs> growth markets. Now, the reason it's not a place like Canada is because they've been drinking maple by the gallon since they were born, as has Vermont. Um, Vermont is producing a lot more maple than they were two years ago, five years ago, 15 years ago. But the market here is saturated, if you'll sort of pardon the visual <laughs> imagery. Um, <clears throat> that maple is being produced either into secondary goods, like you're talking about, um, or it's getting to those markets on the other side, literally the other side of the globe, where maple doesn't really exist as a, a, a native thing, a natural thing. Um, Maple just isn't there. Um, it has to come from somewhere. <clears throat> Which creates an interesting sort of response, reaction, conundrum, I would say. Y'all are probably familiar with these. These are the injection molded plastic containers that yeah. a lot of maple comes in. Um, most of them come from a company called Sugar Hill, uh, mm -hmm. but you will find other companies that uh, produce them. Um, first of all, injection molded plastic, what are they shaped like? Like oh, a they're shaped like old crockery jars. Um, so they're, yes, absolutely. If y'all will look to your left. Um, yeah, there, there's a reason for that. This is evocative of place and history. Um, this, by material, isn't. By shape, they're still trying to capture a little bit of that. Um, but look at the images. What do you see on the images? Well, that one that's in people with buckets. <laughs> 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 this one you have in your book, and I think it's quite interesting. There's the maple the with um, so spigot and bucket coming yeah. out of it. I've not seen that. Oh, really? No. <clears throat> yeah, the, um, th this is one of my favorites. Uh, this imagery is, uh, uh, you'll still see it quite a lot, but uh, it's uh, oh, it is. largely being sort of superseded. But it's an outline map of Vermont with a tap in the side of it. Is that. Um, Industry-wide being used now? I mean, is that on every maple? Uh, uh, Vermont maple. Um, it is. But, uh, it's the Vermont Maple Association or whatever says, you use this. Uh, no, no, this was imagery that they uh, supported for a long time. Now they're kind of moving away from it. 
Um, oh. For reasons that I was just talking about, I'll, I'll sort of expand on that in a second. But this idea of literally, if you put a hole in Vermont, what's going to come out is maple syrup. <laughs> that's that's what this is communicating. If you drill a hole in Vermont, it bleeds maple. Is sort of the the, the notion. And I'll also mention the, the the bucket is a wooden bucket. It's a wooden stave bucket. Yeah. Um, anybody using wooden stave buckets anymore? <laughs> I was going to say I know some artists who paint them, but actually they, they're painting the aluminum in Timmins. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, people who are using them to gather sap, pretty few and far between, I would guess. As a matter of fact, the number of, uh, well, I'm going to phrase that slightly differently. The amount of syrup that goes through buckets is vanishingly small anymore. The vast, vast, vast majority of maple syrup is sap that has gone through plastic tubing. My husband buys these blue bags yep. um, from a dealer up in Rutland somewhere, and that's what attaches to the, to the, um, yeah, yeah. that goes in the tree. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, those, those are becoming uh, quite popular. Uh, yeah. They're uh, they're uh, cheaper. They're um, more. They take up less space, uh, obviously. Um, there are some people who uh, claim that they're harder to clean, although that uh, that response is not sort of universal. Um, uh, but they are becoming quite popular. They don't look like Vermont. Uh, which is exactly the point. They don't look like Vermont. <laughs> I'm not a um, fan. Actually, <laughs> I, I saw a bunch of blue bags when I was driving on a back road the other day. Uh -huh. And I had not seen them before. Mm. Did you go by our house? No, I was in the <laughs> Shrewsbury area. And my thought was, oh, that must be some kind of invasive species eradication. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, you know, I did not think maple at all. Yeah, no, that's exactly it. Actually, I'm going to come back here and grab a couple things from you while I uh, sure. keep talking. Um, because uh, I want to make some sort of connections here. But the idea of um, that reaction, this looks like some sort of invasive species, there is something that uh, feels very clinical about that blue plastic. Um, and I mean, a lot of the tubing is blue too. It comes in other colors as well. Um, but um, the, there is something that feels very clinical or industrial uh, about that. That, as you phrase it, doesn't look like Vermont. Then why didn't they use green? Or is there a reason for? Well, that's a good. Uh, well, there is. There are a couple of companies that do use green for the tubing. Uh -huh. um, but no, I mean for the plastic bags. Uh, it, it's a very similar material, and so they have a similar sort of color. The green that you get is not sort of like a foresty green like your two tops. It's more sort of, uh, um, I don't even know if lime green is quite the right term for it. Mm -hmm. it it's got a, a kind of artificial kids coloring book green uh, mm -hmm. sort of color to it that I still don't think would evoke nature. <laughs> um, it would evoke something else. Um, <clears throat> which actually brings me back to this. Y'all had a chance to take a look at this, these, these flavor notes from Abel. What was your reaction to this? I don't know about the hay and mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> so that that represents different tastes of sap or syrup, uh, syrup, yeah. syrup that has been produced. I wasn't even aware of any of that. It's did this feel like? I mean, you were talking about the hay and mushrooms. That feels like a that, that, yeah. It, my syrup tastes like that. Something's gone horribly wrong. Sort of uh, thing. Um, raisins, orange, peach, and mango. I'm thinking wine. <laughs> You're thinking right. That's where this comes from. Oh, is that right? It's it's not this particular setup, but the idea of trying to pair it with something or have try to use some other flavor you're more familiar with. Yeah, trying to create some sort of uh, taxonomy, some sort of comparability to say these are the flavor notes that I get when I open up the, the bottle. When I pop the cork out of, of this wine, I get notes of black currant and old leather and stuff. You've heard people talk about wine like that. Some of you, y'all are shaking your head that says you all don't do that, which is fair. Um, but the reason that uh, wine has that is because there is some ineffability about the flavor and the aroma of wine. You're talking about uh, how you don't sort of associate uh, maple with the smell necessarily. But the connection between smell and taste is very strong in the way we process, and therefore it's strong the sort of way we make the meanings of smell and taste. And so you want some vocabulary to be able to talk about the complexity, the variability in the smells and the tastes of wine. Well, maple is ineffable too. So having flavor notes was an attempt to try to equip people with a similar sort of vocabulary. 
really didn't really take to Rock Knox. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> one of the reasons is because it didn't sound like Vermont or didn't taste like Vermont in people's understandings. Now, there are still people who use this, um, but it <clears throat> didn't get a, a, a lot of wide currency uh, for a lot of the reasons that uh, y'all are articulating. It doesn't feel Vermont. -y. It doesn't feel like maple here. My palate isn't that sensitive, I don't think, mm. for maple syrup. Well, mine is real, actually. Um, and, and, and I think if you've got a bunch of <coughs> maple syrup makers in the room and you ask them to give you um, an evaluation of what they're making relative mm -hmm. to that chart, I wonder how many would come up with those flavors. Yeah. Well, right. this was done in consultation with a lot of sugar makers, uh, as well as other people. So, so some, yeah. yeah. So they're aware of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and there are a few sugar makers who, uh, it's been a while since I looked, but there are a few sugar makers uh, who did a lot of international marketing who incorporated a lot of this kind of vocabulary into their marketing. Mm. Um, and that brings us back to China and Japan and mm -hmm. Australia, mm -hmm. the big growth markets. Um, the imagery of an outline map of Vermont with a hole drill on the side of it, that means something in Vermont. That means something in New Hampshire. Doesn't mean a whole lot in Osaka. No. Doesn't mean a ton in Melbourne, right? <laughs> Not really gonna hit in Beijing. So this imagery and the dude in the red check coat, and it's all, always a dude. It's a very <laughs> masculinized thing. Um, sugaring is understood as a very male occupation. Although sugaring is a very whoever is doing it kind of occupation, especially uh, historically traditional. Um, anybody who's ever been on a farm, worked in a farm, knows you don't really get to be dainty about who does what. When yeah. work needs done, everybody's doing it. And maple, because it has this very strong, strict seasonality about it historically, when that time of year rolls around, if you're on the farm, you were working. Yeah. Exactly. Um, but the imagery is very male, typically. The guy in the red check coat. That guy means something in Vermont. That guy means something in New Hampshire. Uh, you got the, the metal can back there in the back. Um, that guy's wearing a green check coat, interestingly. He is. Um, but he's from Quebec. Oh. Uh, <laughs> that, that bottle is uh, from uh, Quebec. Um, and boots. And it's on the corner. It's on the Vermont corner. Yeah. Yeah. It is so intrinsically tied into the place. That imagery, even though the vast, vast, vast majority of maple syrup isn't produced by somebody who looks like that anymore, isn't produced with those wooden buckets. A horse drawn sledge? When's the last time you saw one of those? But that's the narrative of maple. And that's a very strong narrative of maple. But that narrative means something here. Not so much in Melbourne. Not so much in Beijing. Not so much in Osaka. I so wonder, I wonder how Aunt Jemima got on the invitation. Maple so, syrup. Well, that that th there's that's a whole other story. narrative. Yeah, there's a whole other uh, sort of narrative of that <laughs> development uh, <laughs> as well. But it's a woman. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, part of it is. Uh, well, both uh, her gender and her race come into play because the people who are traditionally the home cooks, um, uh, that is a different sort of narrative uh, that uh, ends up shaping uh, that iconography, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> the imagery that you'll see, uh, the, <clears throat> the industry moving toward, I'm not going to say that uh, what I'm holding in my hands now has completely replaced the, the guy in the red check coat because it very much hasn't. But you're seeing more and more of this kind of imagery. Um, start one of those in the front. Um, I'll pass a couple of these around the back as well. That's, um, that's what William just carrying about. Are these recyclable? Uh, they are, yes. On the tray? I'll give you the Ohio one. Oh, just to keep them on. Exciting battle. But if you look at the imagery on these bottles, you don't see the horse, you don't see the bucket, you don't see. The sledge. You don't see the guy in the red check coat. What do you see? Maple leaf. Maple leaf. Yeah. Bright colored maple. Yeah. Sort of strong colors. What else? Well, you know, I was taken by dark color and grade A, because I grew up with grade A and fancy being light color. We'll get to the grades in just a second, because you're on, and that gets back to the color and the flavor thing um, <clears throat> as well. Because there's an awful lot of meaning that is cooked in, again, for the part of the finance, it's cooked into uh, those names as well. So yes, keep that inside of mind and we'll get, get there. What I think is funny is the old iconic iconography was old. 
it was of a anachronistic time. And so the first thing I noticed here is yes, it doesn't have the guy, it doesn't have the it doesn't really have anything of the maple server in operation. But the barn has two silos. And silos are going out like the dinosaurs anyway. Ah. Yeah. So this is still yeah. anachronistic. There's still some evocation of the way we were. Mm -hmm. There's still some evocation of tradition, heritage, history, yeah. some amalgam of those things, because those aren't all the same thing. Um, <clears throat> but there is some sense of an older way of doing things that we still want to draw into the thing that we're doing now. Nobody's putting the tubing on their label. Um, if anything, they're removing, as you point out, they're removing a lot of the uh, sort of hallmarks of the production process and replacing it with maybe little hints, maybe maple leaves, a mountain, trees in a sort of genericized way. Nature speaks to the consumer in Osaka, in Melbourne, in Beijing. That idea of this is natural, that's going to be a selling point. Um, that's going to be something that people uh, at least are going to have a better chance to react to no matter where you are in the world compared to, well, who's that guy in the red check coat? Um, because the growth in the maple market is at these places so far away, the locality, the localness kind of has to go away too. And you need something that's a little bit more understandable as universalizable. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so you get this kind of shift in the maple narrative to be, this is nature in a bottle. <laughs> you talk about coming to uh, Vermont uh, with your family since you were four years old. Taking one of these back home, wherever home was from yeah. Vermont, yeah. means I've got a quart of Vermont with me. Mm -hmm. And if I nurse it, maybe I can make it last all year, but I'm probably not, I'll probably eat it all by this weekend. Um, <laughs> but, <clears throat> You're one of my grandsons. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're a type. We, we understand. Um, this is a portable bit of Vermont. When you come to Vermont as a visitor and you're able to take it home with you, well, those labels. Well, these are quite interesting, I think, because they're uh, they're promoting what the maple syrup. They're telling you what maple syrup is. Number one, I mean, um, but. I mean, here's Dan confirms what Vermont tastes like. I yeah. mean, there's logos, and I mean, there obviously is a marketing thing going on. But the other thing that struck me is that this one here has um, dark. It's grade A, mm -hmm. and it's dark color, robust taste. Mm -hmm. And this is Vermont grade A medium amber. Mm -hmm. I thought it was all supposed to be standardized. <laughs> well, uh, one is older than the other, right? Yeah, a little bit of what you look at there is the bottle in your hand right now is much younger than the, the bottle yeah. near me. Um, so uh, there is a, uh, there was a change uh, not that many years ago to yeah. a more standardized Isn't this what there. Williams carries? Isn't that the logo on what Williams has in there? So. Um, you'll see that one quite prominently because oh, that, that okay. is... Uh, I, I, actually, that one is... Yeah, that one's Highland Sugar Works. Um, the, there's another bottle floating around. Oh, this one here. Uh, can I take out this for a second? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> this uh, label is one that the Vermont Maple Sugar Makers Association is kind of moving toward, um, away from Vermont with a uh, hole drilled in the side of it, more to, uh, yeah, there's a sugar house there, there's a stack of wood, um, some wafting smoke, but it's very sort of illustrative. It doesn't look like an, uh, a photograph, it looks like a, you know, kind of uh, a misty image, and it's trees and nature. It's a little bit more genericized in that way. <clears throat> so they're moving away from this hyper-local to Vermont <clears throat> to, <clears throat> excuse me, hyper-focus on nature. Because again, this sort of travels, this narrative travels a lot better than this one does. This is a great narrative, don't get me wrong, but it's got a limited range. If you even get to Ohio, Vermont kind of becomes a, is, that, that's, that's, that's in Maine, right? Um, <laughs> it sort of becomes diffuse and that carries less impactful meaning. Nature, that carries impactful meaning in all sorts of places. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about the grading, because you mentioned this uh, as well. I just wanted to do a time check, it's oh, 11 o'clock. Oh, is it really? Yeah. Okay, I've been yammering for so long. All right, we'll wrap up then with uh, talking about the, uh, the uh, grading. Vermont, for a long time, had its own grading system. It had a category called fancy, um, which was the lightest syrup. Um, 
and then it got uh, increasingly uh, darker and with increasing names light amber, medium amber, dark amber. Right? And then there were things like grade B and grade C. Uh, C was used for cooking. Um, you wouldn't sell that to anybody. Although if you really like maple syrup, you would sneak a little bit for yourself because it's a really, really strong stuff. I actually kind of like uh, grade C myself. Um, but Vermont had its own system. The International Maple Sugaring Institute, I believe is the name, it's MC, uh, IMSI, uh, they created a grading system that was uh, standardized for everybody, except for Ron. Um, because Vermont being Vermont, we want to do it our own way. Um, <clears throat> there was a, uh, a long period of dual systems kind of existing. Well, Vermont has shifted to the grade A uh, light, medium, dark, and robust taste and light taste, that vocabulary, because that matches up with the MC system. Um, it is now uh, standardized throughout the world over for anybody who's packaging their and labeling their uh, maple syrup according to those standards. Um, <clears throat> Vermont resisted that for a long, long time. Uh, one of the reasons that well, you were the first one who mentioned fancy, uh, and you talked about uh, light and fancy and grade A being considered the best. That system was created by sugar makers. Fancy is hard to make because the cleaner your rig is, the better chance you have to make fancy. If there's any dirt in there, and I don't mean dirt like you know, clumps of dirt and moss. I mean, if there are any little bacterial inclusions in your pan, that has a tendency to darken the syrup. So if you were able to make light syrup, what was called fancy, that was seen by sugar makers as a sign that you are a very skilled, conscientious sugar maker. So they came up with a, a category of fancy and decided it was the best, not because of what it tasted like, but because of how hard it was to make. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the system now is not based on any of that. It's based exclusively on how much light passes through the syrup. That's the only thing that the grading system is based on. It's simply how dark it is, how opaque it is. Hmm. Now, there is a correlation to taste, but it's not causal. They just happen to overlap a good amount of the time, but not all the time. As I said before, you can get very light flavored, dark colored syrups. Um, but the uh, grading system is simply about how much light passes through. So the way it gets described though, is uh, actually, could you read the label on the, the one that has the flavorings on it? Um, robust taste, yep. dark color, robust taste. Uh, that's the one I was looking for. Oh, this one <clears throat> is medium amber. Yeah, that one just describes the color. The other one, dark color, robust taste. taste. Yeah, that is consumer driven. That system is trying to get the consumer to think about what it tastes like, not just how hard it is to make very light colored syrup. So there's a very strong shift from the sugar makers deciding this is what the best syrup is, best in terms of how hard it is to make, the quality of the sugar making, to best in terms of how it fits your palate. Very strong change, mm -hmm. very consumer driven, very American capitalist in that way. Hmm. Um, so I'm wondering how many of them in this room would consider grade A dark color robust taste, no. given what we grew up with? No. No. Well, grade? All the syrup that ends up on store shelves is grade A. It's like eggs. Everything is A. It's uh, all A now be, uh, because yeah. that's what you want. You, nobody buys the grade B eggs. Nobody <laughs> buys grade B butter. Um, it's all grade A or maybe double A. Ooh, even better. Um, but the grade A part is just this is the top level. Therefore, it's stuff to put out on the consumer shelves, whether that be in my farm yeah. stand or you know, yeah. in Shaw's. Yeah. Um, the rest of it is describing the color density, like how dark it is. And now some very rudimentary flavor notes, robust, light. Does it have anything to do with the timing or the sap? Like I always thought the first batch of sap came up lighter, but that may be just because there's less biologics in it. Uh, probably a bit of both. Um, most people who sugar over a season do tend to see their syrup darken through the season. Yeah. No matter where it starts and where it ends, there's a darkening in that process. Some of that is probably going to be the change in chemistry within the tree. Some of that's going to be the change in chemistry within your boiling rig yeah. or in your collection rig. 
Um, so uh, it, they're, they're probably both things that are influencing that. That's another thing that made Fancy rare. Like I said, was the really good stuff you got first. Um, yeah. And therefore that was seen as more desirable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is Fancy Green. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that bubble's a little older than others. 2011. Um, all right, now I don't have a conclusion because I don't like to sort of talk. I like what we've done, talk with each other. Um, you've uh, told us our, our uh, time is drawing nigh, so I'm going to shut up now and ask does anybody have any final things they want to throw down? I do. Oh, go for it. <laughs> so we've heard a lot. Uh, first of all, thank you, Mike. Oh. <laughs> Before I forget to have applause for the great presentation, um, also let me say that there are refreshments that Nancy brought, including maple cookies. Um, but what I wanted to mention really quickly is something about the history of maple sugar in Vermont. Not exhaustive, just something that I always find really cool. The um, abolitionists in Vermont, um, and, and Massachusetts as well, um, politicized maple sugar. Of course, back then it wasn't maple syrup they were making, they were boiling it down to sugar because you could transport that better. Um, but the slave economies of the South produced two major things, cotton and cane sugar. And the abolitionists didn't want to have anything to do with, with that slave economy. So they really promoted wool, which the merino sheep boom helped them out to do and maple sugar. And so maple sugaring parties became major politicized political events, anti-slavery political events for a while. They, they would even refer, <coughs> excuse me, they would even refer to uh, cane sugar as slave sugar. Uh, this was very strong public discourse uh, because, and there is a, a obviously an anti-slavery element in there. <coughs> uh, and there's also a, a sort of uh, a bit of a nativist we make our own sugar, let's not be dependent on foreign oil aspect to it as well. I mean, foreign oil is the, you know, yeah. the version we'll see today. They were but, putting foreign oil on food. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, but there's not, there was a, because a, a lot of the uh, uh, cane sugar was coming from uh, the Caribbean and other controlled colonized areas uh, by, uh, they, uh, people thought of as uh, that money was going to end up going to Europe, uh, ultimately. And so there's this sense of, them, this is our sugar and this is free sugar. Um, this is one of the things that I love about the kind of research that I get to do, is that there is so much meaning and there are so many meanings in maple. Um, one of the reasons that I do the talks the way I do, I sort of start saying, what do you got? Is because it can go anywhere. Because all of these things, I mean, if you had started off uh, with that today, I'd be riffing on politics at the moment. <laughs> That's because these cultural artifacts, these things that are parts of our lives, are not just things, they are processes of meaning making that we engage with constantly and that process is utterly fascinating mm -hmm. and if we pay attention to all the meanings that we make well we can understand something as simple as our breakfast in a little bit different a little bit more deeply one of the things that you didn't mention as far as maple goes is during the revolutionary war ethan allen's time everybody was cutting down maple trees Vermont and New England and just burning them so they could ship the ash out because there were chemicals in the ash that were needed by other countries. So they almost depopulated a lot of maple trees. Well, not just maple, but all trees to make the yeah. potash for and pewter yeah. and whatnot. Yeah. You know? Yeah, the, the part of the narrative, part of the, uh, I mean, you started us off saying uh, maple means Vermont to you. Part of the reason that that is so strong connection is this sense of the primordial Vermont maple forests that, oh, those trees are not that old. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Vermont has been shaved several times in its history for things like, the trees are things like sheep. There are all sorts of reasons where Vermont has become a relatively untreed place. Yeah. But that narrative of Vermont and tree, especially maple tree, is so strong that it survives the physical realities of the landscape. Some, some might even say it sort of defies the physical realities of the landscape. Mm. But again, it just shows you how much the meaning is what the fun stuff is. Mm. I could look out my window and see a parking lot, but if in my mind it's filled with trees, that's the meaning I'm going to see when I look out that window. Okay. <laughs> with buckets hanging. <laughs>
Blue bags. Blue bags. Blood bags, yes. All right, well, thank you all very much for coming out. And most especially, thank you all for playing with me. Um, sure. These talks are deaf if I ask questions and nobody answers. <laughs> you all were on the ball, so I very much appreciate the conversation. Well, we are known for having the best audiences. <laughs> and uh, come back next month, we'll have Bill Mayers, who's just written a book on the history of Vermont humor. Okay. Oh, so right. it'll be a very serious talk, I'm sure. <laughs> Thanks. Great. As was this. <laughs> I try not to take myself too seriously.